said Molly. Yeah, I was about to say, is there a way I can get that in my apartment? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry about the uh, final arc. Yeah, I told you that was interesting. I said it was interesting. I said it was
Connors? Oh, Connors. That's the good guy. Uh, we try to be good guys. Uh, when I say I'm at the government, you know, you ask about the time. Sure, sure. You guys found me our favor for anti dumping and you guys clean the game between yourselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here with us. I think that's just logical. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, the patents are my location for a second. Take the time you're going to hear our own. What we're trying to say is that we're a field office driven organization. We're not just in DC. But I'm, I'm here in Indiana. I'm a loser. I did work in Washington. But you know, I spent a few years there, and I've been back here almost 20 years. I live in Greenville. I work in Carmel, suburb of Indiana. If you're in California, it's Carmel. Right. So it's if you're in Indiana, Indiana, it's Carmel. It is a very nice place. I've been there a lot. I am in California. I am in Yeah, we actually have a Chinese Foreign Service officer. On a station with us right now. She speaks. She's officer. Should be her. Absolutely. I'm representing Mark Miller. Hi, Mark. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. I can pass on. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Of benefits of free trade agreements 
provide for manufacturers in America is displayed right here at Toyota. After the trade agreements were signed, Toyota Manufacturing announced they would be exporting Sienna minivans to South Korea, automobiles made right here in Indiana by the Indiana citizens. In addition, the Indiana Farm Bureau reported the three agreements are expected to increase direct exports from Indiana alone by $54.7 million per year, potentially add 500 jobs in here in Indiana. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Hoosier businesses in the 8th Congressional District exported more than $2.6 billion in merchandise, with only $1.2 billion less than half going to free trade agreement partners during 2010. In addition, more than 6,000 jobs are directly supported by exports. In a study by the Business Roundtable, there are more than 760,000 jobs linked to trade in Indiana with exports exceeding $26 billion, ranking us 14th among the states in the United States for exports. Total employment in Indiana related to manufacturing exports was 233,600 in 2008, according to the National Association of Manufacturers. In addition, export of manufactured goods grew 73% from 2003 to 2010. If we've learned anything about production of American goods is, is that if we are allowed to compete on a fair playing field, we win because our products are superior. One of Indiana's greatest economic advantages is its access to inland waterways. One of the three ports of Indiana uh, is called Posey County, Indiana home for 36 years. Ports of Indiana Mount Vernon moves cargo by rail and water, <coughs> more cargo by rail and water than any other port in Indiana, comprised of approximately 8,000 feet of Ohio River shoreline and nearly 965 acres of land. Port of Indiana Mount Vernon is too valuable an asset for Hoosiers not, not to be utilized to help us dig out of our current economic struggles. Despite, despite the economic downturn, the Port of Indiana Mount Vernon saw an increase in shipments in 2011. According to their own figures, Mount Vernon Port handled over 4.7 million tons of grain, coal, fertilizer, steel, minerals, and other products. This is an increase of 12% over 2010. As one of Indiana's foreign trade zones and, and nearly 130 acres for business development, Mount Vernon Port is already equipped to increase Indiana's manufacturing business footprint in the global economy. Mount Vernon Port should be utilized to move Hoosier products to new global markets, which will not only build our economy, but also trade jobs right here in Indiana. Southwest Indiana's transportation advantages do not end there. With completion of Interstate 69, we'll be able to truck more products from the tri-state area than ever. Also, the largest network of rail one of the largest networks of rail in the country provides another op option for manufacturers to move products efficiently and effectively. As your congressman, my main focus is to send Hoosier products uh, to foreign markets, not Hoosier jobs in foreign countries. We know that we make a higher quality product than any other place in the world, and we enter into trade agreements to ensure the world market is fair to American products. When we can compete on a level playing field, we win. And finally, I'd like to say that countries around the world and organizations around the world, like the European Union, uh, are aggressively pursuing trade uh, amongst themselves, uh, and sometimes to the exclusion of the United States. And so uh, I think trade is a very important subject right now for our country. Uh, and I think in a global economy that all of us need to recognize that we need to work with other countries and establish fair policies that allow uh, our mark, uh, the, their markets to be open to our products, uh, and that's what we're trying to establish. So uh, thank you for being here, and then I'll uh, now have uh, uh, Tommy yeah. Forker from Toyota Manufacturing. Right. So, here, so I'll, uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'll show you, so, uh, show you folks some pictures and a little bit of some presentation stuff in just a moment. First, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, this is our, our visitor center uh, for the, the production plant here in Indiana. We, here at this facility, we build uh, Sequoia, which is a big SUV, the minivan Sienna, and a smaller SUV Highlander. Uh, and we, the, the subject of this particular meeting being export, uh, we export all three models to, to different places around the world. Uh, and it has become quite a large business uh, for us. 
and, and we're thankful for that, uh, and our team members are thankful for that as well. So, so with that, I'll, I'll uh, tell you guys a little bit about our export business. So first, I'll, I'll show you some stuff here, and I realize that you're welcome to come up if you want, but um, I'll point out some facts, and I'll just show you some pictures that might be entertaining. I didn't completely understand the audience, but I think this is going to be entertaining to just about everyone, some of them. Uh, our export business uh, right now, uh, we ship about, it changes, it's quite a dynamic business, the export business, and it depends on different markets around the world and, and their need. But to give you some idea, we ship about 15,000 vehicles, uh, Sequoia vehicles here in the Middle East, and uh, many countries there, Saudi Arabia being the largest uh, purchaser of our vehicles, but we ship to Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, Qatar, and uh, Lebanon. Uh, I've been to all those places. It is, might not be my favorite vacation spot. Some of them more so than others. <laughs> I did get to uh, to snowboard on the in the indoor ski slope in Dubai. I did that. That was pretty cool. That it, it kind of went down here from there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's not it's not necessarily a, a I'm sure the folks that live there call it home is just a lot different than I'm accustomed to. Um, so, but that was our, our first big uh, splash in the export market was to the Middle East. And we launched there about 2008, give or take. Um, we've always exported, I guess, you know, within North America, we have so such a diverse uh, group of people that work here. And we work with so many people around the world that for us personally, we get to the point where we, we might not think of exporting to, to Canada as an export and exporting to Mexico as an export, but we do. Uh, and we export quite a lot of vehicles there, and we always have. But outside of North America, our first big splash was in the Middle East and into those countries, and I spent uh, a substantial amount of time there uh, with those folks. But, um, the thing that we have to learn from, and I guess everyone that exports does, but the thing that was important to us was to understand what the customer needs were and how those customer needs were different there than they are here. That's specifically um, the main goal for most of our, our fact-finding trips as we would go there. Uh, for example, some part of the, in Dubai, there's a law that you have to have your car clean all the time. And you have, like you get a ticket if it's dirty. That being the case, they wash their car nonstop. If you wash your car nonstop, uh, then you might notice any uh, maybe paint uh, flaws that or paint quality that other folks might not. So knowing that going in uh, prepared us uh, to to make some improvements that in turn help our uh, our customers here in the U.S. and in other areas that we ship to people as well. Um, but learning stuff like that in. In a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, the law is not the same as the law here. I know you're surprised by that, but it's substantially different. Um, one of those things as it relates to vehicle manufacturers, uh, there's virtually no adhered speed limit. I th they have some signs, and they tell me that it says the speed limit, but I don't think they obey the speed limit even as much as we do. So, They'll drive literally whatever maximum speed for that vehicle. So for Sequoia, they may be driving 120 miles an hour for miles and miles and miles. And then at their first intersection or traffic stop, when they have to make a stop, and they stop. When you run an engine, uh, for the car people in the room, you run an engine, internal combustion engine, for that period of time at that high rate and fuel consumption, then when you slow down, it takes uh, our, it takes anyone's system a little bit of time to recover to, to fix the uh, fuel and oxygen ratio. So it's that to tell you this, it creates quite a sulfur smell when that happens on any car, not a, to a Toyota car, but a GM car, a Chrysler car, whatever. So you have to prevent any of that from infiltrating into the vehicle. Um, so that was also something that we just didn't experience here because it, it never, never happened. So. Our goal is to try and learn all that, to, to learn our customer base and to learn as much of that before we actually start uh, producing or sending uh, the vehicles into that market. Uh, because we want them 
to buy more because we want to make more and hire more people and have more jobs and everyone's jobs be secure. So our goal is to sell as many vehicles as we can and one way to do that is to keep your customer base as happy as, as possible. I think that's, of course, that's common sense. But so we, we start with the Middle East and uh, I said I spent a lot of time there and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm not originally from Indiana. I grew up in Western Kentucky. I'm a University of Kentucky graduate, go Cats. I apologize to the Hoosier fans in the room. I, I don't dislike the Hoosiers at all. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, I, I grew up as a meat and potatoes kind of fellow. Um, and I'll show you some, some pictures that, that should be quite entertaining. I'll tell you a little bit about the difference in uh, in their culture and ours, and then how that relates to, to our our vehicles. So, this is just a, a sign, a uh, billboard. Uh, I was, uh, this is right on the Red Sea in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Of course, we're the only plant in the world uh, that makes Sequoia. We're also the only plant in the world that makes Sienna. So, any Sequoia or Sienna you see anywhere, uh, it was made here by our folks. Uh, so, so that is a, a billboard there, and I, I'm going to give you uh, a general idea of the scope of things there. This is just a dealership, a normal dealership, not like a special dealership. They all kind of look like this. It's uh, they really like vehicles, and they're quite extravagant in their way of displaying them. And our particular vehicle, they were, like this is the lady, the nice lady that greeted you when you came to the front door. Every, almost everything's on this scale there. You can notice the lady sitting there. Again, this is just normal. Uh, this is a, a, a model of a dealer there. This, this uh, column shape there, here's the actual dealership itself. This is a combined Toyota and Lexus dealer. This this dealer's in it's in Saudi Arabia. I cannot remember the town, the, the city. But this over here, this is a full um, gym just for their customers. So you'll notice tennis courts, swimming pool on top, sauna, barber shop, the whole thing. If you have a vehicle there, um, this is for you to be able to. to and it's quite, it, it looks very uh, Orange County, California, and it is, it's a little over the top. Um, so they kind of have a grand scale. You go from that to this. This is just on a roadside camel farm. This is me and, and, and some of our team. Uh, the gentleman here in the, in the native dress of the area is one of the distributors from that area. But you literally go from from areas like that uh, to areas like this, and so what that means for us is our vehicles are going to be used in a multitude of different ways. That they, they, I told you they drive really fast, and they do, and they'll drive really fast like that, and then they'll take a hard left turn out to the middle of the desert and not really slow down that much. It's a little scary, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, <laughs> so going on my first test drive with those guys, and I've been I. Uh, I do have a professional driver's license. I've been driving prototype vehicles for this company for 16 years. And some of the, I wasn't scared so much. I was a little more scared that I didn't know that guy's skill level because I thought we might end up on our top. I'll tell you, the, another thing that's really, really cool, not cool at all really, but this is a, a hotel where I'm staying. And I want to make you feel safe. This here that you can't really see, I'll show you what that is in just a second. Uh, that's a guy with a machine gun on a concrete bunker. Uh, you had to zigzag to get to the to the, uh, to the front door. So I'll tell you, living in this country, I've, I've not experienced this outside of any Marriott or Hilton or Best Western. So uh, this guy's intent was to make me feel safe. And if that didn't make me feel safe enough, there's this guy in the back of the hotel with his little humpy with a uh, and that didn't make me feel quite as safe as I think he expected it to either. Uh, so the country, the country over there is quite different. This is a uh, traditional uh, meal over there, and it's quite customary. I was the 
always tell everyone, I'm, I'm, I work for, people here work for Toyota and I'm no one's boss. Their boss normally, I, I know their spouse's name and that's who the boss is. I know how this works. Uh, if they're guys, for sure. The women, maybe not so much, but yeah, I know my boss is wife. So, uh, but here, I was the lead, the head guy for, for us, I guess, on this trip. And it's customary, this is like some cooked goat. God bless the goat. But, uh, and it's customary, this is really gross, and that's the head of the goat. But it's customary for the, the, the guy leading the group there, you know, the head of the delegation thing, thanks. The head of the delegation there will split the brain of the goat with the head of the delegation that you're with. So I had the fortune, uh, great fortune of, of splitting the brain of this fellow. And it, 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 was, it was great. It was fantastic. Uh, so this some more of our folks and, and our vehicles in their place. From that I'll move. So our next venture, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I apologize, the order's not exactly as I want it, but we we started selling Sienna's, uh, and the first thing when I got when I got here, this is our president, Norman Cuno, and it was my, he and myself, uh, and some other folks uh, traveling from our place. You'll notice the, the flowers. This is how they introduce a vehicle, that they dress it up like a derby winner. Um, and it was, there were flowers all over the place. Sometimes you couldn't see the vehicle for the amount of flowers. But um, this is another market where we had to learn the customer. And learning the customer is so important. And, and this market, you know, is a little different uh, than the Middle East market. And for us to be able to learn, for them, they're selling this over there, as you'll notice the, in the English up at the top here, first class limousine. They're selling this as a luxury vehicle and movie stars over there. We were at the uh, their version of the Oscars, and their movie stars were being driven up in our Sienna and led on, on the red carpet. It was quite, it was it was neat to see. What country is that? This is in uh, South Korea, since this was in Seoul. Um, I've been a little bit through, there's not a whole lot other than Seoul in South Korea. There are some other places, but Seoul, by far, most of the folks live there. Uh, and it's, uh, it, because of their local, us breaking into that market was, was, was really good for us, because you guys know maybe Hyundai is a Korean-made vehicle, and even though this is an American-made vehicle it's with a Toyota badge, it, uh, it was difficult in the very beginning, but we're doing quite well now. Uh, and it shows the dedication of our team members and we'll make a good vehicle. So we went from there uh, to our, our current, most, a lot of our folks today are uh, in Russia. So this is, is some of our team in front of Russia and I, I had these pictures in, in order like this because if you'll notice the young lady on the left here in the photo, that jacket, same jacket in Australia. So we're a well-traveled bunch. I guess this is uh, Watson's Bay in Australia, and this this is the guys. They tell me that the picture was taken. This is in the middle of the outback in Australia, and there was a kangaroo, and there's no kangaroo, so I tell them I don't really believe there was, but they, they attempted to do that. But this is the middle of the outback, and this, they said the significance of this picture was this is their water supply for this place, and uh, they have to ration water throughout the week because they only be delivery once a week and uh, if you're in the middle of the outback, uh, it, that's a, of course a great commodity. So I think those are all the, the pictures that I have. I thought you guys would, would enjoy the goat picture. Um, but we, I'll wrap this up. More along the theme, or, or keeping with the theme of understanding our customer, like for each of these countries, we had to understand, and for every country we've learned, but what's different about this? So for example, on the roads when it snows in Russia, they use a different uh, chemical than, than we do. Uh, they use magnesium chloride, calcium chloride uh, to, to control ice and dust. Well, we have to be sure that our vehicles can, can withstand that. So we, had to, we have to make a few changes to some specific parts to be able to withstand that environment. So that's kind of what we do. That's kind of our export theme. Um, 
we want to sell as many vehicles to as many folks everywhere across the world as we can. That's, that's what we want to do. Um, and we're, we're at about 20,000, I think, now uh, a year, and we'd like to double that. So, again, thank you guys for, for coming here. If you have any questions for me later, just ask. Well, I think this is a great example of how Indiana products can be you know, made by Indiana citizens here in the U.S. Um, with, the, with the proper agreements in place um, can increase exports. South Korea is a big example recently. Um, Russia is a, is a market that's, that's opening up to us in a lot of areas, and we're currently uh, in Congress working on uh, these type of agreements to open up the Russian, Russian market to American products. Very Next, uh, with the U.S. Department of Commerce, Mark Google. <coughs> Thanks, Mark, for coming. Appreciate it. I want to thank the Congressman uh, Ushan for allowing us to be here today. Again, I'm Mark Cooper, U.S. Department of Commerce. Thanks for hosting us, Toyota. We appreciate your uh, allowing us to be with you and Thanks to everybody that's here. Uh, we appreciate the interest in international trade. Uh, I don't know if I should stand up or sit down or whatever, but uh, I guess I'll stand up and talk about this. But uh, uh, we believe that uh, international trade is a contact sport. And that's why uh, it was interesting to see uh, Tommy's presentation talking about how you have to go to the markets. You have to be a part of those global markets. And that's why the Commerce Department, I, I'm based here in Indiana. And uh, I represent the entire state. We believe that exporting matters to Indiana, and we want to tell you why. You go ahead and give us a couple of slides here. But I'm going to skip all that because I don't have time to go into all that. And uh, we do that. we'll do that another time. Just keep going. Let's stop here for a second. Why? One reason why exporting matters is that if you look at the projected world economic structure in the future, you're going to see that some other economies you're going to see some other economies like China and India, which we talk about all the time. The growth of the developing world. Uh, times are changing. That's really the uh, the message I wanted to say. I'm a Hoosier boy. I grew up here, you know, and I just thought, you know, in the 70s when I was a kid, you, you wouldn't see air travel as it was really the domain of wealthier people. You didn't, you know, normal people or middle class people or poor people didn't travel as much. But now I, I teach at a university adjunct. And uh, I'll ask how many kids went on spring break to somewhere, and they went to France, and they went to the Bahamas, and they went all over the place. And so this whole world has become so much more globalized. And but we're seeing a shift in the, what uh, Fareed Zakaria, one of the commentators of uh, international trade, says: the rise of the rest. Places like China, China, and India are growing. And so what we're our job, and what my job is to make the, sure that Indiana companies can compete and win in the global economy. Go ahead just for a second. We can see where China's place in, the size of uh, China's economy, the, the world's second largest. And you see the size of that base, uh, the US, China, Japan, Germany. It uh, sometimes surprises people. If you go ahead. This I thought was an interesting little factoid that China's wanted to buy AMC. I don't know if anybody ever goes to AMC as a, the cinema, but this shows this is a seismic shift in what is actually happening in the global economy. That a, that a country like China, they're uh, buying AMC for 2.6 billion. They're the second largest movie theater chain in the U.S. Times are changing. Go ahead. Brazil uh, is overtaking the U.K. Of course, of this year to become a, the world's sixth largest economy. Could be a changing of the guard. So you're seeing a developing economy like Brazil and a stalwart like the U.K. In the past, you can see some of these things that are changing for all of us. Go ahead. What do we do? What, and why am I here? And what do we have to do about it? The role of our office and the role of the commercial service part of the Commerce Department is to promote export and to help you uh, level the playing field, as the Congressman said, and, and to promote U.S. businesses internationally. I tell people when it comes to exporting, that's exactly what we do. Go ahead. This just talks about the global market. The Congressman alluded to this earlier, that 95% of the world's consumers live outside the U.S. These kind of factors are interesting. More than a billion new consumers worldwide will end with middle class in the next 15 years. And so there's a burgeoning middle class. 
we can see if you looked at the country of India, you're going to see that 300 million people, the 400 million people, are growing into the into the Indian middle class. So why do we care? Because that means that there are more goods uh, that uh, that these consumers in these countries are able to buy from the United States. If you go ahead. You see that. Uh, the untapped trade potential, though, is not just in the biggest companies. And this is a, a, a misapprehension, a misnomer that I'd like to make sure that we uh, dispel, which is you don't have to be the size of Cummins, or you don't have to be the size of Lilly, even though they are successful, or even the size of Toyota, to be successful in international trade. What we try to tell people all the time is that it doesn't have to be the largest company, what, whereas they are successful, they have resources. But we want to be a resource and a partner to you. That's sort of what this slide says. That in 2010 SMEs, that's a government jargon for smaller, medium-sized enterprises. We have to speak in alphabet. They teach a course in that. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but uh, of all the U.S. companies that export, 58% export to only one market. This is key. This is why we're here. 58% of all U.S. companies export to only one market, and 83% export to one to four. So most companies are not fulfilling and tapping their entire potential. And that's what we want to do. Go ahead. Uh, the congressman mentioned about where Indiana is ranked in, in exporting, so we, we won't, and you can flip on, you can go ahead, we won't uh, belabor that point. This shows, uh, our picture's a good one, I like to show graphs that go like this. Basically it shows the picture of Indiana. Uh, we've had some bumps along the road as you saw, but Indiana's export uh, picture has been bright. And actually we've done better than some of our Midwestern colleagues, if you go ahead. This shows that fact, that we didn't far, uh, uh, fall as far, uh, and we've done a little bit better. Uh, year on year growth. These uh, is important for us to note because people always ask me, well, okay, where does Indiana export? What are we selling to and, and what are we do who are we doing business with? We see if you flip one more time, I think it moved one more time. You'll see that people always ask me, well, if we didn't know where to export, then where should we go? I, would, I always tell them to look at our, our NAFTA partners first because we have found and we see that almost 45% of Indiana's exports go to two markets. So if you're looking at exporting, you should at least consider one of those two. It doesn't always mean it's the case, but when people say, well, I gotta start somewhere, consider those. Then if you look at, uh, thank you very much. If you look at the rest of them, then you're gonna see a pattern. You're gonna see Canada, Mexico, then you're gonna see Europe, and uh, people ask me because this is a national statistic and I've been called by a bunch of newspapers, so I always like to bring it up. Why are we selling to Afghanistan? Uh, <laughs> they become our top, I've been doing this a long time. That has never happened before. <laughs> I can guarantee it. Uh, uh, that has never been there. But because of our military engagements in Afghanistan, it's be, that, and the Hummers, basically, if you know the Hummers are made uh, by AM General of Northern Indiana, then that's, uh, that's why part of that is there. Go ahead. This shows uh, that uh, slide, I've shown that to a few people that were just curious of, of uh, export to Afghanistan, so we won't go into that. So what does Indiana export? By sectoral, it's going to be, we are a transportation-based economy. We do sell transportation equipment. We Almost one-third of Indiana's total merchandise exports are in this major sector. Chemicals, machinery, primary metals, you can go ahead. Uh, but we also have to note the role of life sciences in Indiana, which is, I think this is a great uh, slide. Though every state wants to be a hub, Indiana is one. They accounted for 23% of all Indiana job growth from 2001 to 2007 was in the life sciences. So it's a big sector for us. You go ahead. And this is, I mean, we don't brag enough sometimes, but this is a big deal. That Indiana has 33% of the global orthopedic industry based right here, right there in Warsaw. I mean, that to me is actually a fairly shocking thing when you actually think about it. So this is a wonderful statistic to show, yet again, Indiana, we are competitive. We are in the global marketplace, and we are succeeding. Go ahead. This just basically is a, a rough synopsis of uh, exports to Canada and a breakdown. But what, the most important thing to see is watch the color pattern change. You're going to see vehicles and parts going to Canada. That's the mix of other things are smaller. Then if you go to the next slide, you're going to see industrial machinery going to Mexico. So even though I say Canada and Mexico are good markets, they're not the exact same markets. So that, I mean, that's why when each country, company like yours looks at these markets, everybody's got a different story to tell. Everybody's got a different strength. And so you're going to see Canada and Mexico, they're going to have a different base. And then if you click to the next market, you're going to see Germany 
where they have a, a demand for pharmaceutical products. So you see the whole mix. Even those, these are our three primary uh, trading partners, the top three at least. You see the different product names between. Go ahead. Uh, I, I talk about this uh, just because people might find it interesting if you're at a cocktail party. Did you know that Indiana gave the world pork and beans? You may never have done that. So I want to make sure, <laughs> I want to make sure you did that. It invented during Civil War by Ben Kent. And also the world leading popcorn producer. You may not have known that, but there's a lot of popcorn produced. If you go ahead, Weaver is the leading popcorn producer worldwide, churning out nearly 30% of all popcorn sold. So we, again, these are stories that perhaps people don't know about in the end, that we do these kind of things. It's not just heavy manufactured goods, it's not just automotive, it can also be uh, goods that are actually food-based like popcorn. Small businesses, I've already told that story, make an impact. They support uh, 12 million jobs, exports pay more, and uh, one in five Indiana manufacturing jobs uh, are supported by exports. So the story is, and the story for me to tell you today, is that that's why we believe it's important. Go ahead. These are some success stories. If you just click a couple times, you'll see the four attempt I have is putting graphics in. Oh, that's a That's all right. One, one click backward. Okay. Okay. Well, if you could have seen this slide, <laughs> you would have seen that the, I gave some examples. Uh, in northern Indiana, they had a company called Lady who made uh, grain silos and things like this. Then we had uh, a company, Cook Biotech, which, which made mesh for surgical implants. Then we had Escalade Sports, who does ping pong tables and Gorilla Golds. Uh, they're right down here in this part of Indiana. And we had a company that made paper mache dog heads. We had a lady who was on the Food Network that, uh, that cooked fondant, which I didn't even know what fondant was until uh, I met her. And, and so it, it really it doesn't matter. The, the idea that Indiana can succeed in many sectors, many products, you can too. This is who we are. We cover the entire state of Indiana. My colleague, Deshaun, who's passing out the folders in the back, covers uh, Southern Indiana for our office. And so we want to make sure that you know that we want to be a resource for you. Go ahead if you would. So these are the kind of things that we do. And I've got about a minute or two. Uh, we assist in developing an export strategy. People say, they'll come to me many times and say, Mark, you know, I don't know where to begin. So then we'll help them sit down and try to figure out where should you go? What should you do? How should you get there? What market should you enter? Help you locate those best markets. Then a, pro a program that we do quite a bit of, and even on the way down here I was working on, is we have services to help you find matchmaking partners. We have a service called our Gold Key Matchmaking service, which allows you to, to network and connect with partners in any of the countries where we have a U.S. Embassy. So wherever there's an embassy in the world, we can connect you to agents and, agents and distributors and partners. We help with financing, uh, at least recommend these options, payment issues as far as something gets stuck in customs, and if there's a re regulatory problem, we do that too. Uh, as the Congressman mentioned just a bit ago, we believe the trade agreements that he has worked on and others in Congress have worked on has helped open many of these markets for us so that we can be more competitive. If you go ahead, this just talks about the Gold Key Program, and if you go ahead, another program that we have, I just don't, we don't have time to go into this, but I think this is uh, one of the last things I'll say is our U.S. Embassy Networks includes 160 international offices, 82 countries. They're in, we're in 96% of the world's commercial markets. So, you have a friend in the export business. Uh, not that, still with Shane Company or something like that, but uh, you have somebody here local, you know, and I'll tell you this story. I've been here a long time. And so I, I in the old days, I went out, and I'm, I'm from Southern Indiana. And so I went out to a guy's factory. I go door to door, and I knock on company's doors. So I'm at this guy's factory door. He meets me. He's wearing overhauls and says, yeah. <laughs> and I say, hi, I'm here from the government. He almost shuts the door, but he, but he does open it. And uh, he, I walk in and I say, I want to talk to you about exporting. And he sits down, we sit at his car table in his factory, and I start talking to him about exporting. And I, I don't give him this entire pitch, but I tell him these kind of things, and he's looking at me kind of quizzically. And, and uh, I'll never forget this, that he said, Mark, let me tell you, son, to me, Kentucky is an export. And I said, well, sir, I, I just want you to think a little broader that you have opportunities outside Kentucky, outside the Midwest, and the genie's out of the bottle. We're in a global market now, and I believe that you can be a part of it. And that's the message I'd like to leave with you today, is that the genie is out of the bottle. 
We believe we do live in a global economy, and my mission today is to try to help us all think broader, that we are in interconnected, international trade is a contact sport, and we want to help you compete and win in this global economy. I'm Mark Cooper, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Dushan McCulloch is back. So, okay. We can go to uh, Mark. Luann Luan is the Associate Director of uh, Techno Technology Applications with Pete Johnson Nutritional. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you for the that. invitation. Mark Miller and I are going to represent the Tri-State World Trade Network today. And our goal is to tell you about what our group does and the services we offer to local industry. So what is the purpose of the Tri-State World Trade Network? Well, it's really to promote exporting and international trade in the Tri-State region of Indiana, Illinois, and Kentucky. We sponsor educational activities, programs, and events. And the goal is to increase knowledge, promote understanding, and increase participation in exports. And we also provide local business and industry with two things, both a network of resources as well as a, a network and resources to explore global markets. And we'll talk a little bit later about how we actually partner with Mark Cooper on some programs, such as our local local event. So how are we funded? Well, we're a nonprofit volunteer organization, and we tie closely with the Chamber of Commerce in Southwest Indiana. So we raise funds through seminar series, through corporate sponsorships, through uh, U.S. Small Business Administration grants, the state of Indiana, and many local partners. So we have a, a board of directors with our group. I'm the chair, and we also have Kevin Cook from Cook Enterprises, Lydia Johnson is our secretary from the Chamber of Commerce, and Doug Jost from the airport. And then we also have a wider board that we meet quarterly, and it's a group of local business, business and industry leaders, as well as cooperation with the University of Southern Indiana, the University of Evansville, and people such as Mark Duchamp. So how can we help companies in the tri-state area. Well, we provide networking opportunities to partner you with other businesses that have similar needs or need information for exporting. We provide access to subject matter experts. We you know, use our, utilize our board of directors as well as our network to help tie companies together to work on promoting international trade. And we also provide educational seminars. And this is really a thrust of what we do. We put on um, approximately two to three seminars a year, and we're gonna go through a few of those just to give you some examples so you can take part in the future. At our events, we utilize our network to provide speakers and um, information. These are some representatives that have participated in some of our past events. Uh, smaller companies, larger companies, both universities, Toyota. We had an event yesterday with the Toyota representatives, and we thank all our partners with our events. Just to talk a little bit about our events, They're, they always have a theme around promoting international trade and exporting. And when you look at statistics, I think the Wall Street Journal had an article last year that said half of the economic national growth, the nation's growth, was through exporting since 2009. And that's the biggest number since World War II. So it's really the way for a business to grow and expand outside of the U.S. market. So we focused uh, last year on Brazil as it's rising in the ranks in terms of uh, GDP. Uh, Brazil was a, a focus for us. And when we do the seminars, for example, the Brazil seminar, we actually had a representative from the, one of the Red Spot joint ventures in Brazil who was actually doing business down there, is Brazilian, tied in with other speakers to, to bring uh, realness to the information. We used uh, Andy Reinke, um, who's from Foreign Targets, Inc., who had an agreement with the Small Business Development Association in Indiana and came in and we talked about how to accelerate your business through exports. We, we also try to get different twists on how uh, companies can improve the exporting they, they are already doing. So we had a seminar on achieving cross-cultural effectiveness. So we had representatives uh, speaking about China, Mexico, uh, Japan, and India, and talked about how you do business and the business etiquette in, in managing your relationships in these different cultures. 
we had an interesting event on one size doesn't fit all where we actually delved into the different types of business models, whether it's joint venture, direct ownership, direct export, et cetera, so that we could provide information when you look at your company, the best way to do business when you look at China and you know, some of the large emerging markets. We, we focused one specific event on doing business in China, being a key, key market. And then we also brought in uh, a lawyer who talked about international IP rules and then we had a follow-up session where we talked about contracts and how you establish contracts in, in various markets. Uh, and just one more note, we also, before we, I'll hand over to Mark to talk about some of our events, we also partner with the Tri-State Manufacturers Alliance and we have a peer group that we sponsor. There are various peer groups within the TMSA and our deals with international trade and exporting. So when we have our quarterly events, or three times a year events, we will then follow up with a peer group, a more hands-on dialogue series where we delve into the topic in even more detail. And now I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks, Lynn. And again, thank you, Congressman, for having us. Thank uh, Toyota for hosting us and, uh, and participants for coming today. Uh, I'm just gonna talk briefly about uh, one of the uh, uh, the, this Global Business Fundamental Seminar Series, which was a six-part series that we did in 2007-2008 that went a, over the course of 12 months. Uh, and we, we hosted it at different businesses throughout southwestern Indiana. Uh, it was very successful. Uh, and what we were trying to do is educate the workforce about some of the skills that they need to know about being in global business or trying to get into the global business. So we had sessions on import and export basics. We had a session on global marketing. We had one on international business communications, uh, supply chain management, trade finance and legal issues, global business management. Well, the idea was we, with this event, we were trying to provide the basic set of skills that anyone in your organization would need to help grow their, their international presence, their global presence, as well as to educate a, a, a business that was emerging into the global market on the kind of skill sets and the kinds of things that they needed to be prepared for. Um, and, and we partnered with the Chamber of Commerce, or I mean the Department of Commerce, we partnered with local businesses, and, and it's a great illustration of the resources that exist in this community businesses that are already in this community and the knowledge that they have. And we, through our organization, are able to bring all of those resources together so that that knowledge is shared 